Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me uh, today. We're going to be continuing our series looking at the book of Jeremiah that we started last week. Don't worry if you haven't watched last week's video yet. I'm going to start with a little bit of a recap, a summary of what we discussed last week. And if you do get the opportunity later on, you can go back and, and, and watch last week's video. But what we saw was that this young man, Jeremiah, who was about 17 years old, was called to be a prophet by God to the people of Israel. He was not very happy about this calling. He was apprehensive about it. He was scared, largely because he wasn't a confident public speaker and he felt far too young to be doing the work that God was calling him to do. But we saw that God reassured Jeremiah. God said that he would put his words on Jeremiah's mouth and that he would strengthen him for the task he had to perform for the kingdom. And we saw how relevant this was to us today because every single one of us has a calling for the kingdom. We all have some task to perform and we may feel scared about this calling. We may feel apprehensive. We may simply feel that our calling is too small, that it's inadequate compared to other callings. But what we saw is that God would strengthen us, whatever task that we've got to perform, however big, however small, and that every task has an eternal consequence for the kingdom. And every task is significant. So Jeremiah was called to be a prophet at a tough time in the history of Israel. Now there were 12 tribes of Israel, but 10 of the 12 had been taken into exile by Assyria. So only two tribes were remaining in and among Jerusalem. And these two tribes had been warned time and time again by the prophets that they needed to repent from their sinful ways. But these warnings had gone largely ignored. The people of Israel were a sinful nation. They did not honour God like he deserved. And we see that disaster is coming. And it's Jeremiah's job to warn his people to repent while there is still time. So we're going to pick up our reading of Jeremiah in chapter 1 and we're in verse 11 through to 16. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting towards us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods and in worshipping what their hands have made. We see in verses 13 to 15 that disaster is coming upon Jerusalem from the north. We learn later in the book of Jeremiah that this will involve the conquest of Jerusalem by the Babylonians and that God's people would be taken into exile, into captivity in Babylon. The imminent judgment of God for the sins of the people is illustrated really clearly in this text by this boiling pot which is tilted towards Jerusalem from the north. We see that God's judgment is coming upon Israel because of their wickedness in forsaking God. They have worshipped other gods and created things rather than the creator. We also see an illustration of an almond tree, which shows that God is watching over his word and that he's faithful to it. And an almond tree, when it comes into flower, it flowers really, really suddenly, very, very quickly. And that was what happened when Jerusalem was captured by the Babylonians. It happened very suddenly, almost out of the blue, but obviously it wasn't out of the blue. These people had been warned by Jeremiah that this was coming and they had ignored the warnings. And in our text, we see that God is a just God. He cannot let the sins of his people 
go unpunished. Throughout the book of Jeremiah, we see Israel as a nation that have forsaken God. The imagery used in chapter three is heartbreaking. If you get the time, read chapter three. It's heartbreaking to read the language in it. We see Israel as the bride of God, and yet they have chased after other gods. They have put created things above the creator. And Israel is described as a prostitute with many lovers who have defiled the land with their prostitution and with their wickedness. And the people of Israel are described as having the brazen look of a prostitute. They have refused to even blush with shame. Now, when I read that, that just really hit me. These people were sinning, but they didn't even realise or acknowledge that what they're doing was so abhorrent to God. They have refused to even blush with shame. They don't see their sin as sin. And Israel's main sin is that they've turned away from the living God, that they've replaced him with other things. If we look, take a look in chapter two, we see some of the charges that are brought against Israel because they are a nation that worship idols, that offer child sacrifices and they listen to false prophets. But in verse 13 of chapter two, we really get to the heart of the matter where the Lord says, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now on the surface of it, this seems a crazy decision because cisterns were muddy pits used for storing water. But that water would have been muddy, it would have been dirty, it would have been unfit for drinking. And the Israelites have turned away from a pure, beautiful spring of water to drink from these dirty wells. And these wells don't even work properly. They're leaking. They can't hold the water that's in them. And we are so like the Israelites in this, when we don't put God first in our lives, when we try to live our own way and do our own thing, and when we don't honour God through our words and deeds when we put other idols in our lives that shouldn't be there. And sin is when we don't give God the glory that he deserves because he deserves infinite glory. And just like the Israelites, God cannot stand sin and there has to be consequences associated with it. And yet throughout the book of Jeremiah, we're also reminded of God's love for his people. Despite their sinful ways, despite their wickedness, God loves his people. And throughout the book, he says, it is not yet too late for you to repent and to return to me. And we really see the heart of God in this issue because God loves Israel. There is chosen people. And at times he's almost begging them to return to him. But on the other hand, you can't let this rebellion go unpunished. It's the same dilemma that every parent faces when a child misbehaves, because that bad behaviour cannot go without consequences. There has to be a consequence for the bad behaviour. And yet when punishing the child, the anguish and suffering of the child will bring no joy or satisfaction to the parent. It's a horrible dilemma. But there has to be a consequence or a punishment for sin for the Israelites. And yet, despite the warnings from Jeremiah and the other prophets, the people did not repent from their sinful ways. And Jerusalem fell into the Babylonians in the year 587 BC. The city of Jerusalem was almost destroyed, but not entirely. 4,600 Jews were taken to Babylon where they would live under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you want to see full details of this, have a look at chapter 52 in the book of Jeremiah. The Israelites were having to deal with the punishment for their sin. So we are all like the people of Israel though, aren't we? Because we all struggle to put God first in our lives. We all sin by not honouring God like we should. 
we have all followed worthless idols and failed to drink from the spring of living water. But just like with his people Israel, God is saying to us today, right now, that it is not yet too late for us to repent and to turn to him. God's mercy is freely available to us this morning. And if we trust in Jesus as our righteousness, as our only hope of standing upright before a holy God, he is able to forgive all of our transgressions. He's able to look at Jesus rather than us and see his holiness. And when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin anymore. He sees Jesus, which is the most incredible news. And in chapter 3, verse 2, just after a brutal description of the sin of Israel, God says, would you now return to me? You know, Israel have done all these horrible, horrible things. And God says, would you now return to me? And this is what grace is. Because of all the, after all the dreadful things that we've done, God still wants us to be his people. And he wants us so badly that he sent his only son to die on the cross to take the penalty for our sins. He was prepared to give his most dear possession for us to save sinners like you and like me. And that is the gospel this morning, that we don't deserve this amazing news, but we get given it freely if we trust in Jesus and his death on the cross. And if you're not a Christian watching this this morning, I urge you to consider Jesus because all of us need a saviour. We all need this way of standing upright before a holy, just God. And if we don't have a saviour, the consequences of our sin are dreadful. But God's salvation plan is glorious and it's freely available today. Shall we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross of Jesus, where your blood was spilled to wash over our sins. We thank you that even though we are horrible, sinful people that don't deserve this, we get your grace and it's a free gift. So I just pray for soft hearts to receive your word this morning and for lives to be changed for all eternity. In Jesus name. Amen.